So I'm glad to be here. The only time I got nervous is when Vanessa confessed her age. I did a, <laughs> I, I, I did a quick multiplication. And I thought, hmm, it's almost 2.0. Uh, and, you and, and, you know, well, I mean, look, my, for a long time, my wife and I uh, have, you know, we, we yes, the nuclear family. Um, we are the conventionally powered part, and our children are the nuclear powered part. Uh, and for some years, I used to talk to my students. I mean, I am now actually Professor Emeritus at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. Um, I would tell them, no, I didn't see the sun hit the Great Pyramid. Uh, on the first day it went up. Um, and, and then uh, then we might make insider jokes like, but I do remember when rah, rah, rah was a religious chant. The only people that catch on were the classicists on that one. Um, now, I, I have to begin with the usual disavowals, which in, uh, I have learned I had better, which is um, I'm not talking for any of the institutions I'm connected with. I'm the research director at INET. I'm not talking for INET. Uh, and for, uh, the, I think the Roosevelt Institute or the University of Massachusetts, Boston, eh, they, they can decide what they think, but uh, I'm not claiming to speak for any of them. Uh, now, uh, I have this problem, uh, which is, eh, it's a little bit like El Greco wandering into Rome or Madrid or Toledo uh, back when. I, I mean, I, you can probably recognize some of the things I claim to see but I'm not absolutely sure you will, and I sort of need a little bit, I have to do a little bit more uh, introductory stuff uh, than most people. I have to tell you that it, th you could see this system begin to collapse right in the 2014 elections. I mean, Dean Burnham and I wrote a piece in Alternet, and you know, we, what we did was, uh, I mean, like Burnham, and I've, still, I've followed his interests in that. I mean, people, maybe some people know we taught together for a long time. Uh, at MIT, um, the, uh, you could, it was an amazing election, and we thought it was clear that it was a threat to both parties. Uh, the bottom line on this is this, is you, if you try measuring uh, the drop-off in voter turnout between a presidential election and the next off-year election, uh, well, it's the second largest of all time uh, across the whole sweep of uh, American history. Um, and, you know, there, there are a couple of cases, and, and the turnout itself was the, probably the lowest since um, 1942. Um, and the, when you start looking at individual states, it's sort of staggering. Um, you, you get your back in many, you were in 2014 in the Northeast, parts of the Midwest, and some areas of the West. Now, the Western states had a historically different level of turnout uh, altogether. So, uh, but, uh, like, Ohio was back at where they were in 1814, all right? And New York was down to where it was in the 1820s. That's when they had property suffrage. So uh, the point is, is that turnout in, in 2014 collapsed just to amazing levels, all right? Uh, and th this is just to say more. And, you know, this had one kind of nice thing, but it was, as usual, upside down. Um, it's just a fact that since the 1890s, which is when turnout collapsed, please note it did not collapse in the 1870s, which I know there's all kinds of historians, some of them at UCLA, who act like, you know, this was a, a clear fact. Sorry, look at the turnout stuff that uh, Burnham and I put out. We, just two or three years ago, we c compiled all these old voting statistics that he had. It's out there. Anyway, the point is this, is that Southern turnout had been rising since the Civil Rights Revolution, but it was still well below the Northeast. They finally caught up. 2014, now you've got equality at a very low level. Uh, you know, welcome to the new world. Um, now, um, and Burnham and I drew the conclusion, hey, the bases of both parties basically hate the establishment of both sides. It was just obvious. We said this. You know, we can't, we can't be plainer than this. This is not like, oh, well, I should have realized. Nah, we just said it. Goodbye. Um, and the thought that this was going to make big trouble in 2016. Uh, now, um, I'm going to then I tried to cut this thing as short as possible. Um, what you've, I, I will simply state, and I sort of have to just state it. I can't, we can talk about it. I, I, I'm not trying to just be dogmatic, but I got to state something as a fact or I'll never get done. Um, the, uh, the, the bottom line here is I think it's clear that you can see 
that the electorate, big chunks of both parties' electorates this year, and I don't find myself out of uh, kilter with uh, either of you folks on this, um, they, uh, although I, I might maybe a little on the intensity, uh, the truth is, is that a good chunk of the base in both parties really hates their establishment. I mean, if you had a reliable feeling thermometer, and there was a lot of work done actually at UCLA, and some of it's pretty good, I have to say, uh, on feeling thermometers. but. Uh, I don't believe some of their claims that now, for example, recently coming out of, uh, actually coming out of Stanford now, uh, that say race is now been eclipsed by party as the most passionate thing in uh, politics. It's a long discussion. Uh, what I do think is this, is that it's clear that large chunks of the party base not only don't like their establishments, they're not much inclined even to listen to them. They just brush it off. Part of the reason Trump can get away with talking like he does is they just figure, as, as somebody said, okay, look, um, if he, we'll put him in. If he doesn't perform, we'll just fire him. You know, wonderful uh, thought. Um, the, um, and uh, they just have given up on their party establishments. Also in the Democratic Party. It's like, you know, listening. I mean, I, now I admit this. I hear I have trouble with some of the Vox statistics that they put out on tax stuff and Sanders thing. It's, it's a bit of a problem. Uh, not that the Sanders people, I know far more than I can say about problems there and trying to get a handle on what costs what. Uh, the, uh, the bottom line is that a lot of numbers that people sling around are junk, uh, and everybody knows it. Uh, but like you could see in the last three weeks, you had four, I think, former uh, chairs of the Council of Economic Advisors on the Democrats joined by, well, Paul Krugman and others, trying to just say that the whole Sanders argument has no business being made. Now, I think that turns on an argument of, about things like potential supply, uh, that they did not characterize correctly. I think their claim, I think Jamie Galbraith's piece on the INET blog was very useful, which the, the, the Galbraith line was essentially this. Uh, look at their record on forecasting. It's no, it's no better. And, and I, I, uh, I agree with that completely. That is not to say that I think you, can ex you could do potential supply at 5% a year for 10 years. I don't believe it without hitting inflation. But uh, the question of what's possible here needs a much bigger discussion than it's had. Uh, the Clinton people are trying to sort of dampen that discussion down. Um, I think I know who the chairman of the transition team is when, in Clinton, and you're not going to like it when you find out. I mean, uh, what's actually going on in the Clinton camp, my reading, this is, this is a clinical analysis. I'm not claiming this has to be true, but on the other hand, I've been around a while. More than Vanessa, I have to say. <laughs> they're, the, uh, they're, they're, um, they are moving actually to the right, not to the left. I mean, the rhetoric may be moving to the left, but watch, uh, watch and see. Uh, and I, I have a very good record on this, as Bill Black kindly reminded everybody just the other week on Naked Capitalism. I did an analysis of who was paying for the Obama campaign in 2008. I told you back before he was nominated, there would be no financial reform. I haven't done that kind of work on this election. The amount of money floating around now is so enormous, it takes a long time uh, to do it. But I've seen enough to know. I will tell you that uh, Hillary Clinton is not going to give you sweeping financial reform, uh, shadow banking, or anything else. Uh, anyway, um, the thing that strikes me about uh, this electorate is that it is actually getting flushed out by the world economy. I take pretty seriously the Case Deaton paper, uh, real, now real famous, uh, where, yes, it actually worked, okay, um, where that's actually a death rate, I think, per something. Uh, this is a problem with my slides. Um, and, the, you know, very famously, the white death rates have been going up for the uh, low-income groups. Um, and uh, you also know from, if you've seen the stuff, this is the, the uh, is basically that it, the Trump vote does seem to be correlated. Now, this is one variable correlation, right? So you better watch uh, there. But I basically would take the conclusion that in a lot of these uh, states uh, where uh, the annual death rate among non-Hispanic whites, it's not a bad predictor of... Uh, where Trump is going to come out, though I actually take 
your point and uh, about what uh, we can talk about the base question later. I can't know. Um, I, I also think that on the um, Sanders story, uh, you got to wake up here. Uh, what the story about youth, I actually think that's an occupation and employment story to a very large degree. I have two children in their 20s, uh, both as it happens are working. Uh, but um, a lot of folks I know who have kids are they aren't working. And the transformations in the economy, especially if you're young, are absolutely terrifying. A number pointed out not long ago, uh, like a week ago, uh, by somebody, it was a study of how much, you know, trans, uh, what do they call it, the gig economy sometimes, how many, what, how many job transitions do you have out of careers, that number has, a, has gone, depending on how you measure, and there are some real measurement problems here, it's about doubled uh, since 2005. The, the numbers that stick in my head were from 7% to 15%. I guarantee you that that disproportionately hits the young. Uh, and all, I mean, you know, most of you have heard uh, that uh, many corporations no longer offer any, one, no pensions at all, or two, um, your, your own, uh, the defined benefit thing is out, the uh, defined contribution is in, and meaning you do it, find a Wall Street person to handle it who will overcharge you and will earn less than the market rate of return uh, there. Um, now, the point to grasp is really this, and it's put out nicely by an occasional co-author of mine, Peter Temin, who has a super paper on the American dual economy. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's an Institute for New Economic Thinking working paper. You can find it there. Not hard. Everybody, I think, knows Peter Temin's work. Um, bottom line is what he does is he takes R. W. Arthur Lewis's model of a dual economy, which was for developing economies, which is basically there's a small uh, relatively high income growing sector and then an enormous mass of unpaid, uh, of, of badly paid laborers. Uh, and he makes the simple point, uh, this is the U.S. economy today. And uh, you, I think he's right about that, um, though it's obviously a long discussion. It also affects particularly, you gotta, if you keep this in mind and you start looking at survey data, or aggregate statistics, boy, do you get a different approach uh, to what's going on in there. Um, and uh, it, it leads, uh, we could maybe just do it in the question period. And anyway, my point is this, is the full brunt of the, the, uh, the emerging dual economy, where what's dual in the US, finance, uh, high tech, uh, and similar things versus this vast masses of uh, low wage stuff where, I mean, it, it, you can see companies now do this, not only do they contract out, I'm sorry, not only do they outsource, but they contract out a lot. Some of the numbers are amazing. One that sticks in my head was like Hilton Hotels, which had something like 100,000 employees in the early 60s or so. They now have about 12,000. That doesn't mean they're not doing hotels that on a, on a larger scale than they were. It means that everything is done through subcontracts. Uh, many of those are the worst possible. I do think there's been a long argument about this, uh, but uh, I think it's pretty plain that uh, a big chunk of folks in that low wage sector actually do run wage fraud as a business model. Now, I have to say, I'm not a big fan of the uh, Obama. Uh, administration, but they have done rather well on that. Their initiatives on low-wage workers uh, actually make me uh, almost proud to be a Democrat, though I am not giving this lecture out of any political party coloration. Uh, but the point I want to make today is, okay, so uh, let, let's stipulate that uh, what effectively what I'm telling you is this, is that life has become unlivable for an enormous chunk of the population. Or, um, and there really is some forward looking here, and you see it in surveys, it's why that New York Times business about, well, we got a kind of cyclical recovery going, why aren't we all happy? Uh, the other week is just missing the point. Uh, people can see that there's no future. Uh, that you can just bust your tail, and no matter what you do, uh, you can't protect yourself, you're at the mercy of the business cycle, um, and the sort of standard approaches to measurement, I am highly critical of the folks who are walking around saying we're near full employment. I cannot believe the discussion that the Federal Reserve is having. I mean, they're all sort of sounding like, well, maybe Stanley Fisher, for example, got up there and just said, well, we're, you know, we're real near full employment. No, no, we're not. We're not anywhere near it. 
Uh, and I mean, the, the numbers you want to watch here are the bear on the labor force now. How many people have dropped out? Um, and anyway, so what I want to know is, okay, how do we explain what's going on? This is where we briefly detour into uh, the enchanted forest, uh, which is uh, what I like to call the investment approach to political parties. I was very just going to run this off staccato. I can't, you know, if you want to, if you hate it, hey, it's a nice day, go take a walk. Um, the uh, for most. Yeah. Bottom line is most Americans, for political action is just a lot more costly than the classical liberal theories imagined. Uh, if the population is not organized, and the U.S. population is actually disorganized, uh, then uh, basically power passes by default to major investors. So political parties are basically bank accounts. I mean that quite literally. And then there is all the cash now that's non-party. Uh, which, the Supreme, which is, however, related to the party, however much the Supreme Court and candidates well, you know, thinks different. Um, and then now let me go through the ritual uh, dance of purity uh, to explain. Uh, but beware of focusing just on campaign funds, though I'm about to focus just on campaign funds uh, for a few minutes. Um, this in particular, look at, let's see, can I get this? Yes what I'd call the spectrum of political money, um, these are huge amounts of money. I believe I am correct that just about every appointment in the, um, this comes out of a paper of mine on Congress, um, the, uh, uh, just about every appointment in the Obama administration, um, people were being paid close to a million dollars or more a year for something. Some of them, like Jack Lew, turned out to have payments from organizations that kicked in if they went into the government. That's a, now apparently a common uh, story. Uh, there was one guy in the administration uh, who might, you might see in the transition, uh, in the Clinton transition. Just remember you heard that here first. Um, he had something like nearly a million dollars in consulting fees over I got a couple of years from, from Goldman Sachs. What was he advising on? Philanthropy. Now I will tell you, I mean, Technically, I am in the philanthropic sector these days more than I am in anything else. Nobody gets paid a million dollars for working in philanthropy. That's not a market wage, folks. Um, what you think that is, you're welcome to. I think it's very plainly a kind of, um, let's say, incentive payment. Um, the, uh, then there are all these others. One I, I want to make a, a, a bit here. Uh, it turns out when you start looking, there's a nice thesis on this where it turned out I, I was so good, I said, what happened to this lady? It turned out she joined a foundation. A lot of foundations uh, just make, make huge chunks of grants to like the spouses of congressmen and women. Uh, and lots, there's a lot of philanthropy here that is not philanthropy that is clearly targeted. Um, the, um, okay. Uh, and then now this is my other, well, this is my one stop defense about claims that campaign money drives everything. This is from a paper I did with Rob Johnson, one version out on the web and another in a book. Um, I sim we simply plot the compensation of regulators and the regulated. This is out of the financial sector. Um, and what you see there uh, is, you know, from about 1967 on, as finance gets deregulated, everything takes off. It's, look, these folks are in the position of this tells you that I haven't been in a church in a while. Is it Elijah who gets carried up to heaven in a golden chariot? Um, the, uh, it's sort of like that. If you can walk, the guy who first turned me on to this fact was in fact a former uh, CFT, uh, Commodity Futures Trading Commission commissioner who just said to me, I know that we're, we were running a kind of uh, pre-employment screening thing. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is a bit of, this is a warning about what's really driving the system. What's really driving the outcomes in this system is massive inequality. Um, and when, if you can walk out of your government job and you know, become quite wealthy the next day, or even if they make you wait six months or a year. Now remember Bernanke, what, I think, I think within a week he was making take 200,000 for some speech. Uh, and similarly Geithner was doing something equally egregious. Uh, there, I mean, look. If you can do that, you're. You, this is. Uh, you're in an insane situation. All right. Now, 